AQA, A-Level Physics. This video is about interference. And this is the bit of the specification that we are going to be looking at in this video. OK, now this is a point source. It could be dipping your finger in a ripple tank, uh, producing these circular wave fronts. Uh, it could be something making a noise you know, uh, spreading waves out in all directions. And these are circular wave fronts. So when, when you do all your diagrams with lenses and stuff, very often you draw wave fronts. The distance between the wave fronts is a wavelength. Uh, and this source produces waves of a single frequency. So a single frequency, so it's a single wavelength. Uh, and these are circular wave fronts. Imagine them going away from this point in the middle. Now, here are two sources and they are coherent. You need to know what coherent means. There are three conditions for coherence. These two sources have the same frequency, they have similar amplitudes, and they are in phase. Actually, they, they can be out of phase, but as long as they're out of phase by the same amount every time, for us, we're going to keep it simple. They are in phase. So same frequency, similar amplitudes, in phase. They are coherent. That's what that means. And what happens is that these waves will spread out. These wave fronts will spread out from these two sources. And in this region I've drawn here, they will interfere. They will arrive at the same time in different places and they will interfere with each other. In some places, they will interfere constructively and in some places they will interfere destructively. Now, what does that mean? Well, look at this. There's wave A at the top and wave B below it. And uh, we've got these graphs are displacement against time at a particular point. So if wave A and wave B uh, add together, and we can use this thing called the principle of superposition to work out the, what the resultant will be. OK, uh, and basically you'll see that on the first example on the left, we get a big resultant because wave A and wave B they are arriving in phase. Uh, on the right of that, look, wave A and wave B are in antiphase. They're 180 degrees or pi radians out of phase. And so they are going to interfere destructively. If they have exactly the same amplitude, then they will completely cancel each other out. OK, so uh, basically the two waves from the different sources arrive at the same place. And if they interfere constructively, we get a big resultant, a big amplitude. If they interfere destructively, we get a small amplitude. Now, if the waves arrive at a certain point in phase, then constructive interference will take place. So the blue lines on this diagram, this is where they will arrive in phase. OK, and whether they arrive in phase or not will depend on the path difference. And the path difference is the difference in how far they have traveled. OK, if they've traveled the same distance, then the path difference is zero. So they will arrive in phase. They started off in phase. They will arrive in phase. If the path difference is equal to a wavelength, then they will arrive in phase. Like one of them will have traveled further than the other one, but it'll be a wavelength further. So they started off in phase and they end up arriving in phase. OK, so if the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths, if the path difference is n lambda, where n is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. OK, so if they arrive in phase, constructive interference. Now, if they arrive in antiphase, then we get destructive. 
They started off in phase, but one of them has traveled, let's say half a wavelength more, so it will be 180 degrees out of phase. In general, uh, we're gonna get destructive interference when the path difference is n lambda plus lambda over two. In other words, if the path difference is lambda over two or three lambda over two or five lambda over two, sometimes you can say an odd number of half wavelengths, or I prefer to say n lambda plus lambda over two, where n equals zero, one, two, etc. So in these places, the red lines, they are arriving in antiphase. Why? Because the path difference is uh, n lambda plus half a lambda uh, different, yeah? That, well, the path difference is that, basically. Now, remember, there's, there is very likely you might get a question and there'll be loads of marks for it. Explain what's happening here. And the person marking it is looking for key words. What key words are they looking for when two coherent sources interfere? Uh, remember, what are the three conditions for coherence? If the path difference is n lambda, they arrive in phase, constructive interference, large amplitude signal. If the path difference is n lambda plus lambda over two, the waves arrive in antiphase, destructive interference, small amplitude signal. I'm repeating myself, aren't I? Why? Because it's very important. Try and include all of these key words in your answer if there's loads of marks. For example, look at this, six marks, wow. Two loudspeakers are connected to the same signal generator so that they emit waves of the same frequency. An observer walks past the speakers as shown, explain fully why the sound they hear from the speakers varies in amplitude. So all of those key words explain that these two sources are coherent and what that means, explain that in certain places, the waves are gonna arrive in phase, depending on the path difference and what kind of interference you will get as a result of that. Six marks, all of those key words. I'm gonna recommend these FET simulations, University of Colorado, uh, and this one is on wave interference and it's well worth having a play with. If you don't know it, have a look at it online. FET simulations, wave interference. Who's this fella? Thomas Young. He's one of the cleverest blokes that ever lived. I mean, you know, Young's modulus, you remember that? And he did loads of other clever stuff as well. The, the last man who knew everything, his, his autobiography, not auto, beg your pardon, his biography, didn't write it himself. Uh, but anyway, in 1801, Thomas Young carried out a, an experiment that was very strong evidence that light was a wave. There was a big argument amongst scientists at the time, is light a wave or is it made up of particles? Isaac Newton was convinced that light is made up of particles and he was very, very influential. He was a very important figure. And then you had other people like Thomas Young and Christian Huygens who thought that light was a wave. And basically Thomas Young designed and carried out an experiment uh, which was a very, very, very fiddly experiment at the time that showed that light uh, interferes and that is something that waves do. Now, <clears throat> light passes through two slits and we see an interference pattern on a screen. Now, we can do it dead easy because we have lasers uh, and a laser is a coherent source. All the waves coming out of a laser uh, are in phase. OK, uh, Thomas Young had to do light from a, a, his window on a sunny day and then it had to go through a single slit before it went through the double slits to make sure that the light was coherent. Um, uh, and the, the slits that we use are made by a machine. He had to make his own using microscope slides covered in black stuff and then scraping slits with a ruler and a scribe.
It was an amazing achievement, a very, very clever experiment. Uh, this is how we would do it in a lab. We have a laser, we have a double slit, we have a screen. And on the screen, we see a pattern of fringes. We call them fringes, light and dark bits, maxima and minima fringes. Uh, the equation that's on the data sheet, W equals lambda D over S. W is the fringe separation. Usually you measure the distance between 10 and divide by 10. And that's a more accurate way of doing it so that you're not measuring a very, very small distance because it's only going to be like a, a millimeter or two. Uh, D is the slit to screen distance, which is usually at least a meter. And then S is the slit separation, and that's uh, a fraction of a, a millimeter, maybe half a millimeter. Okay, and this is how we would carry out the experiment. So have a go at this question yourself. Pause the video, pen, paper, calculator, and I'll show you the answer in three, two, one. Okay, so rearrange the equation for lambda. Uh, bung in the numbers there, you know, 24 millimeters divided by 10. Uh, and we get 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 7, or 660 nanometers, which is about right for red light. Uh, when using lasers, common sense, never point a laser directly at yourself or anybody else. It can damage your eyesight permanently, very easily. Uh, be aware that reflected laser light can be dangerous as well. With the low power lasers that you use in a physics lab, we don't need to wear safety goggles like, you know, like dark shades or anything, but just be sensible and be careful. If you carried out the experiment using white light, then you see these colored fringes. Now white in the middle because all of the wavelengths will arrive there in phase. But then because the different colors have different wavelengths, the angles, if you like, for the other maxima will be different. So we see these colored fringes if we use white light. If you wanted to take measurements, what you would do then is put a filter so that if you wanted just to do red, you would use a red filter. Veritasium. If you don't know Veritasium, the YouTube channel, uh, then you haven't lived. It's very, very good for physics videos. Veritasium. The, the bloke who does it is very entertaining. His videos are very, very good. And this one on the double slit experiment. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's very entertaining, very informative.